Well, I'm so glad you guys are here. Hey, Tim. <laughs> people snuck in. I was in the front rows here, and all of a sudden there's more people here. That's great. Uh, some of you may uh, remember me from before. I'm the guy that doesn't give sermons that's giving a sermon. This is number four. Uh, welcome to anybody that's uh, watching online. Uh, that's an amazing uh, opportunity that every congregation has now to be able to um, share God's word, not just here locally, but uh, with people who may not be able to make it here and also down the road in the future. So, as usual, um, trying to figure out what to speak about is uh, having, this is now my fourth sermon in my entire life, so I don't have like a portfolio of topics that I can pull from. I usually do things organically. I was actually talking to my daughter earlier. I seem to handle these sermons very much like I went through uh, middle school and high school and college. Uh, the day before something was due was when I actually started working on it. <laughs> Wasn't quite that bad this time, but fortunately Judy Heck in her uh, diligence on Sunday texted me and said what's the title of your sermon and that kind of got the ball rolling because <laughs> I was like oh no okay I got to come up with something now I had been thinking about for some reason I had been thinking about the word trust and to show the meandering wanderings of my mind trust led to be thinking about the children in Egypt and that first Passover, and their need to trust God. That led me to the wilderness wanderings, the fact that they lost their trust, which led me to the promised land where the trust was regained, which led me to one of my favorite Bible characters, Joshua. I don't know how I got there from trust, but Joshua is where we're going. Uh, I think most of us know who Joshua is. Even my kids, when they were, as they used to say, knee-high to a grasshopper, uh, they learned about Joshua through a tomato named Bob and a cucumber named Larry. <laughs> some of you may know what I'm talking about, some may not, but there was a Bible series of uh, uh, animated Bible stories called Veggie Tales. And one of those stories was called, called Josh and the Big Wall. <laughs> and we watched that, as those of you with kids or grandkids knows, over and over and over. So most of us probably know something about Jericho, the Battle of Jericho, the walls come tumbling down. I'm not going to talk about that at least not this time around. Uh, but I am gonna talk about Joshua, not just the man, but the book. This is one of, I think, the most fascinating books in scripture, primarily because it's filled with intrigue, surprises, uh, lots of hidden gems. And if we make the effort to dig down into the details, uh, we'll discover that the book of Joshua contains a multitude of spiritual and practical lessons that each of us can learn today. And that's what I'm hoping to draw out today. Hopefully there will be a little nugget here or there for each one of you, probably different for each person, but hopefully we'll find some things. Um, unfortunately, for time's sake, uh, we won't be getting too deep into the book today. Uh, but even in this brief message, I hope we'll discover some powerful insights that you and I can use as we continue our own individual journey to the promised land. So I'm not going to go down too many rabbit holes, but I have to warn you, I probably will go down at least one or two. That's just kind of how I do things. So... Let's knock down these walls and see what's behind them. The first thing you know, you discover when you read the 
book of Joshua is it is a book about war. But it's not about Israel being attacked by its enemies. Israel is the aggressor. Israel is the one doing the attacking. We're going to stay mostly in Joshua, but I'm going to pick out a few verses in other places. This is the first one. In Matthew 16, beginning in verse 15, Jesus says, But who do you say that I am? Speaking to Peter. And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And in verse 18, he says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, most of us know that gates are not offensive uh, weapons. Um, unless you're a Marvel superhero and you have the ability to pull a gate off a hinge and throw it at the enemy, generally a gate is for defense. So Jesus is actually stating that we have the power to attack the enemy and defeat him at his gates. It's not about preparing to be attacked. It's being on the offensive. And that's what Joshua is all about. And so the book of Joshua is also a book about victory. And he, the tools he used to, to defeat his enemies are the same tools that you and I have today. Turn with me, if you have a Bible, uh, to Ephesians 6. Ephesians chapter 6. It's a very well-known verse, but something that I think we need to address every day in our lives and something that uh, Joshua and the Israelites had to deal with. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, we read, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The whole armor of God, a short passage, but he states it twice. So he's obviously emphasizing that. And the book of Joshua is about what happens when you put on the whole armor of God. And also, what happens when you don't. So I'm going to give you a little preamble. Here's a rabbit hole for you, so you can make a little note rabbit hole. Uh, I want to just kind of set the stage and give you a little background. Um, some of you may already be aware of this, but I, this is, I think, something that um, I love about this book. The title of the book itself, Joshua. Joshua in the Hebrew is Yehoshua. That's his name. It means the Lord is salvation. It's the Hebrew form of the name Jesus, Yeshua. The Greek, Iesus, is direct translation from the Hebrew, Yehoshua. There's an interesting thing if you have ever tried to read the King James Version. How many of you have read the King James Version? Okay, quite a few, good. There's a couple of passages that you may come, have come across that um, kind of throw you off a little bit. That name, Iesus, for Jesus is throughout scriptures. But that same name is Yehoshua. In the King James Version in Acts 7, beginning in verse 44, we read, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, 
that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus in the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. Now, if you look at any other translation, it's going to say after brought in with Joshua because that's what it's talking about. But in the 1600s, for whatever reason, they chose that translation because it's the exact same word. And in Hebrews 4, beginning in verse 8, we read, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Again, that word is Yehoshua, Joshua, and that's how it's translated in every other translation I've found. So we see just by his name that there's something interesting going on here. But there's more to it than just his name. Joshua was a firstborn. He was the son of Nun, tribe of Ephraim. What we often kind of forget about is the fact that he survived the killing of the firstborn in Egypt as a firstborn son to become the leader of a physical nation. Jesus was a firstborn. He survived Herod's attempt to kill him so that he could lead a spiritual nation. Joshua was a prophet. He foretold God's plan for the nation. I would submit he's a priest, not formally, but as you read the book, you'll see that he was Moses' chief minister. Joshua comes after Moses, leads his people to victory, just as Jesus did. Joshua is the nation's advocate, even in defeat. There's a passage where you'll read about that, just as Jesus is ours in our many defeats that we have. And at the end, Joshua actually allocates the people's inheritance, just as Jesus will. A couple of little tidbits in Exodus 24, it was Joshua, not Aaron, that accompanied Moses up the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights to receive the Ten Commandments and the instructions for the tabernacle. We read in Exodus 33, verse 11, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. So Joshua was in that tabernacle, keeping it all of the time. And when Moses would leave, Joshua was in charge. So with that background, let's move forward. So we're going to start with lessons from crossing the Jordan. So if you want to turn with me to Joshua chapter 1, as I said, we'll be spending most of our time here. Joshua chapter 1, and beginning in verse 1, we read, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. And it's actually a reiteration of the covenant that God gave to Abraham. There's two things we notice in this passage. First, God speaks directly to Joshua. That's kind of rarefied air. There's only a few people where we read that God speaks directly to them. And second, we see that this land that he's giving to them, it's a gift that he's handing Joshua now again, this might be a rabbit trail, but it, it ties in. You know, a gift isn't a gift until it's accepted. You have to possess it. If I decide to write you a check for your birthday and you choose not to cash it, it's not a gift. If you commit some heinous crime worthy of death, 
and you receive a presidential pardon, you have to accept that. Now, you may say, no, no, that's not how it works. Well, I actually looked that up. <laughs> There's actually, at least as far as I know, one case in the history of the United States, a guy named George Wilson in 1829. He was due to be hanged. He didn't kill anybody, but back then, there were crimes that were worthy of death. Um, he had benefactors that went to the president. He received a presidential pardon, and he refused it. It went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they determined, quote, the court cannot give the prisoner the benefit of the pardon unless he claims the benefit of it. It's a grant to him. It's his property, and he may accept it or not as he pleases, end quote. Chief Justice John Marshall wrote, quote, a pardon is an act of grace, proceeding from the power entrusted with the execution of the laws, but delivery is not completed without acceptance. It may then be rejected by the person to whom it is tendered, and we have no power in a court to force it on him, end quote. George Wilson was subsequently hanged. Does that remind you of anything, that Supreme Court conversation? Pardon is an act of grace, but you have to accept it. It's already there, but if you don't accept it, it's not a gift. Our own inheritance and entry into the promised land is not a gift until we accept it. And Israel is given the promised land, but they had to step out in faith in order to receive it. A couple of people were talking prior to services. You know, there's a tremendous conflict going on in that very land today. And at the moment, Israel's willing to give up parts of that gift to appease its enemies. That didn't work out so well historically. And my guess is it probably won't work out so well this time either. So the nation of Israel had to cross the Jordan. We've heard lots of songs about crossing the Jordan. There's some, some of my favorite songs about crossing the Jordan. Most Christians look at that as crossing the Jordan, Jordan and, and entering heaven, entering the promised land, entering heaven. But if that's the case, we've got a little bit of a problem. Because there's a lot of really bad stuff going on on the other side of the Jordan. It's not the promised land yet. So the first lesson that we learn, both Israel and you and I, discover is first, accepting that gift requires trust, trust and faith in our God. And second, accepting that gift often brings with it confrontation with the enemy. But Joshua received a promise from the Lord. Um, I think this is a extremely powerful verse, and I think it's something that you should highlight in your physical or electronic book if you haven't already. Joshua 1, beginning in verse 5. This is God speaking directly to Joshua. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. And verse 7, only, these are all action words, be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and be of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 
That's a message for us. If you do this, I'm going to give you this. Stay in my word, do what I say, and I will create victories for you. We see this reiterated in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. Paul says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So our own crossing of the Jordan You could say just like the Red Sea, through baptism, through the water, doesn't lead directly to the promised land. But if we heed what God said to Joshua and remain strong and courageous and obedient to his word, he'll be with us and he will fight our battles for us wherever we go. All right, sorry, another rabbit trail. But it, it all ends up in the right place, so hopefully somewhere in the right place. How many of you know about the uh, Jordan River going through the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea? How many of you know that story? A lot of you. But for those of you that don't, I'm just going to kind of give you a little tidbit. So the Jordan feeds two primary body, bodies of water. It flows from the north into Lake, Lake Tiberias, also known as the Sea of Galilee and then continues south to the Dead Sea. We read in John 7, beginning in verse 37, on that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The pure water that flows out of the mountains makes the Sea of Galilee ideal for sustaining life. And because it has an outlet on the southern end, the water is constantly being refreshed. It produces green fields, fruit-bearing trees, rich agriculture, teeming with aquatic life. The water then flows down into the Dead Sea, a body of water that has no outlet. And because it hoards that water, it receives, but it doesn't give, it becomes stagnant, and it's unable to stain, sustain life. In fact, there is no life in the Dead Sea. So that Jordan River, through those two bodies of water, is kind of like us and what Jesus said. We, too, need to let living water flow out of us to others. Keeping the Sabbath, Bible studies, being in God's word, those are all necessary and powerful things. But if we don't let what we know and what we learn from us flow out to others, we're just like the Dead Sea. Something to think about. Okay. And as Jim said, (laughs) afterwards, come talk to me if you have issues with any of this. We're going to talk about one of my favorite characters in the Bible. We're going to learn a few lessons from Rahab. Joshua chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, if you want to follow along. Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. They're called spies, but did they bring back any military uh, military intelligence to Joshua to fight this battle? Goose egg, nothing. The only thing they managed to do was save a Gentile woman. If you read further along, Joshua chapter 6, verses 17 and 25, and actually in the New Testament in James uh, chapter 2, verse 25, They're called messengers, not spies. 
So here's a little homework if you're into this kind of thing. As I said, Joshua, the book of Joshua is rich with type and shadow, type and anti-type. As you read closely, you'll discover there are a tremendous amount of uh, parallels to the book of Ephesians, and there are a tremendous number of patterns that show up in the book of Revelation. This is just the tip of the iceberg. These two seem to fit the type of the two witnesses. They weren't there to spy out the people and try to figure out a strategy. They were there to save somebody. So if you want to dig into those, uh, those things in Joshua, I, it's a fascinating study. So let's set ta- the table here. Jericho, home of the Amorites. Famous in song and story. No, I don't think so. Um, in Hebrew, Jericho is Bet Yarik, house of the moon god. Today it's controlled by the Palestinian Authority. And if you have an Israeli passport or you're an Israeli, you can't enter that area. Again, if you want to dig a little deeper on the house of the moon god, it's fascinating to have at it. It's obviously a bad place. (laughs) And God wants it wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, In Genesis 15, beginning in verse 13, God makes his promise to Abram. He tells Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. That's Egypt. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. I guess the iniquity of the Amorites is about to become complete through Joshua. So back to Rahab. Joshua 2, verse 2. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out, right when the gate slammed shut. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. So this is what we call in technical terms a bald-faced lie. Of course it saves their lives. Could God have saved their lives in other ways? Of course he could. But it raises a question. Is God okay with situational ethics? I can tell you from scripture, no. And yet she's not condemned for it. But if you read Hebrews 11, you'll see she's praised for her faith, not her conduct. Remember, you and I always have to remember this. Coming to faith is a process. It begins with belief and trust, but that's only the beginning of our walk. This lie is not mentioned alongside her name in the New Testament, not because it was okay, but because she was forgiven. We need to remember that even when someone's saved, their spiritual maturity is a a process. And Rahab is referred to in the New Testament, both in Hebrews and James, as a harlot, but never a liar. Joshua 2, beginning in verse 8. 
Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth below. This is from a harlot, a woman raised in a polytheistic, despicably wicked nation. She didn't refer to God as the God of the Israelites. She called him the God of the universe. She believed in a personal God, one that would intervene in the lives of those who trusted him. She believed in the God who would give this land to his people. She recognizes he's not the God of one nation or land, but she calls him the God of heaven and earth. How did she know this? In Deuteronomy 4, verse 39, Moses speaking says, Therefore know this day and consider it in your heart that the Lord himself is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. Maybe Rahab read the Torah. No, I don't think so. And notice in Joshua 2, verse 12, Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to me? No. To my father's house, and give me a true token, and spare me? No. My father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. Notice her priorities. She didn't start asking for them to spare her life. Her family. Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, speaking of those that are saved, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worth, worse than an unbeliever. She's quite a woman, and God is obviously using her. Joshua 2, verse 15, then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall, and she said to them, get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned, and afterward you may go your way. Three days. That shows up five times in the book of Joshua. Another interesting study. Now, Rahab's home being built on the wall that was about to come falling down was the most vulnerable place when the city came under attack. And yet, in this case, it was the safest place to be. I always like to picture in my head the Battle of Jericho and those walls crashing to the ground. And over in one corner on the seedy side of town, there's a little piece of wall that's still standing and Rahab's house right behind it. You know, today you can actually go to that dig site and you'll see a small portion of the northern wall still standing. What a parallel to our lives as Christians. Sometimes the safest place to be is in his arms in the belly of the beast. Just ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So now I'm going to go down another little rabbit hole because I think this is... Again, fascinating. The rabbis say there are four basic ways to interpret scripture. Peshat, which is the literal words of the scripture. Darash, which is using a specific set of rules for interpretation. Sod, or sod, which is the mystical interpretation. And remez, 
which is using a poetic depth of meaning that insiders understand but is confusing to outsiders. All you gotta do is read Jesus' words throughout the New Testament. Everything he spoke in public was a remez. If you knew that that was scripture, you were either in awe or you wanted to stone him. And if you didn't know scripture, you didn't, you didn't, oh, those are nice words. You didn't really know what was going on. So when we come to a passage, passage that seems to toss in a name, a date, location, something that seems kind of irrelevant, that's what, what is called, what the rabbis call a remez. It's a place to dig a little deeper. So Rahab let the men down with a cord. Okay? The word for cord, chabel, means a twisted rope, especially a measuring line. By implication, a measured district or an inheritance. In fact, in 1 Chronicles 16 and Psalm 105, that same word is not translated cord, it's translated the lot of the nation's inheritance, an unconditional covenant that God had promised to them. Now, could this be subtly <coughs> confirming that Rahab and her seed were going to be part of the inheritance? Maybe. But there's word. There's more. <laughs> this word can also mean pain or sorrow. In verse 18, the men tell her to hang the same cord, it's the exact same cord, in the window, but they use a different word, tikwa, and they toss in a seemingly irrelevant description. It's scarlet. The word also means cord, but it can also mean hope. In Joshua 2, verse, beginning in verse 17, So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. Same cord. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home. I read that wrong, but that's okay. So it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. So Rahab's home is a place of refuge, protected from God's wrath by the scarlet cord in the window. Kind of reminds you of Passover. You see, it wasn't being related to Rahab that protected them. It was being inside the home protected by the scarlet cord. It's a good time to be invited over for dinner at Rahab's house. So she lets the men down by a scarlet cord that can be translated pain or sorrow. She has the men wait three days and then she hangs the same cord in the window, but scripture uses a word that can mean hope. Pain, sorrow, three days, hope. Little pattern there. Rahab was under condemnation. She was destined to die. She was an Amorite. Everyone in the city was to die. She was a Gentile. She was outside of the covenant mercies described in the Torah and if ever there was a sinner that experienced grace and mercy, it was Rahab. So Rahab is not only a testimony of God's grace, she's also an indictment of all of the rest in the city because she told the men that the word on the street were that the Israelites were bad news. They were going to wipe everybody out. It was common knowledge. But she was the only one in the entire city who chose to believe that the Israelites were on the right side and to act on that belief. She was a person of destiny, just like you are. She took a path that was in total opposition to her culture. What she was doing was not politically correct. And that's the same path that you and I need to be on. I referred to James earlier, James 2, Beginning in verse 25, we read, Was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. 
If you read that passage, you find out, interestingly, that James in this passage in, about faith and works, he only uses two examples, Abraham and Rahab. Also interesting, and this is what I like, Rahab will later marry Salmon, a prince of Judah. She'll give birth to a baby named Boaz, the kinsman redeemer of the book of Ruth. And of course, it's because of all of this that she's mentioned in the family tree of the Messiah, a harlot in the genealogy of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. But, think about it, everybody in that line were sinners needing a savior, not just Rahab. And we all stand, you and I stand in that same place, not flawless, but forgiven. So one final thought, let's remember like Rahab that our eternal security does not give us the right to sit on the sidelines. And if we are strong and courageous, are not afraid nor dismayed, and are obedient to his word, the Lord our God will be with us wherever we go. Well, we didn't get too far into the book of Joshua, but if at some point down the road I get asked back and Judy requests the title of my sermon, I don't know right now, but it could quite possibly be Lessons from the Son of None, Part 2. Thank you.